This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe. Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Seventeen. A Social Chorus. Amazement sits enthroned upon the countenances of Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Lamley's circle of acquaintance when the disposal of their first-class furniture and effects including a billiard-table in capital letters by auction under a bill of sale is publicly announced on a waving hearth-rug in sackville street but nobody is half so much amazed as hamilton veneering esq m p for pocket breeches who instantly begins to find out that the lamleys are the only people ever entered on his soul's register who are not the oldest and dearest friends he has in the world. Mrs. Veneering, WMP for pocket breeches, like a faithful wife, shares her husband's discovery and inexpressible astonishment. Perhaps the Veneering's twain may deem the last unutterable feeling particularly due to their reputation, by reason that once upon a time, some of the longer heads in the city are whispered to have shaken themselves when Veneering's extensive dealings and great wealth were mentioned. But it is certain that neither Mr. nor Mrs. Veneering can find words to wonder in, and it becomes necessary that they give to the oldest and dearest friends they have in the world a wondering dinner, for it is by this time noticeable that, whatever befalls, the Veneerings must give a dinner upon it, Lady Tippins lives in a chronic state of invitation to dine with the Veneerings, and in a chronic state of inflammation arising from the dinners. Boots and Brewer go about in cabs with no other intelligible business on earth than to beat up people to come and dine with the Veneerings. Veneering pervades the legislative lobbies, intent upon entrapping his fellow legislators to dinner. Mrs. Veneering dined with five and twenty brand new faces overnight calls upon them all to-day, sends them every one a dinner-card to-morrow, for the week after next. Before that dinner is digested, calls upon their brothers and sisters, their sons and daughters, their nephews and nieces, their aunts and uncles and cousins, and invites them all to dinner. And still, as at first, howsoever, the dining circle widens. It is to be observed, that all the diners are consistent in appearing to go to the Veneerings, not to dine with Mr. and Mrs. Veneering, which would seem to be the last thing in their minds, but to dine with one another. Perhaps, after all, who knows, Veneering may find this dining, though expensive, remunerative, in the sense that it makes champions. Mr. Podsnap, as a representative man, is not alone in caring very particularly for his own dignity if not for that of his acquaintances, and therefore in angrily supporting the acquaintances, who have taken out his permit, lest in their being lessened he should be. The gold and silver camels and the ice pails and the rest of the veneering table decorations make a brilliant show, and when I, Podsnap, casually remark elsewhere that I dined last Monday with a gorgeous caravan of camels, I find it personally offensive to have it hinted to me that they are broken-kneed camels or camels laboring under suspicion of any sort. I don't display camels myself. I am above them. I am a more solid man. But these camels have basked in the light of my countenance, and how dare you, sir, insinuate to me that I have irradiated any but unimpeachable camels. The camels are polishing up in the analytical's pantry for the dinner of wonderment on the occasion of the Lamleys going to pieces and Mr. Twemlow feels a little queer on the sofa at his lodgings over the stable-yard in Duke Street, St. James's, in consequence of having taken two advertised pills at about midday, on the faith of the printed representation accompanying the box, price one and a penny a penny, government stamp included, that the same will be found highly salutary as a precautionary measure in connection with the pleasures of the table, to whom while sickly with the fancy of an insoluble pill sticking in his gullet, and also with the sensation of a deposit of warm gum languidly wandering within him a little lower down, a servant enters with the announcement that a lady wishes to speak with him. 
a lady says twemlow pluming his ruffled feathers ask the favour of the lady's name the lady's name is lamley the lady will not detain mr twemlow longer than a very few minutes the lady is sure that mr twemlow will do her the kindness to see her and being told that she particularly desires a short interview the lady has no doubt whatever of mr twemlow's compliance when he hears her name has begged the servant to be particular not to mistake her name would have sent in a card but has none show the lady in lady shown in comes in mr twemlow's little rooms are modestly furnished in an old-fashioned manner rather like the housekeeper's room at snigsworthy park and would be bare of mere ornament were it not for a full-length engraving of the sublime snigsworth over the chimney-piece snorting at a corinthian column with an enormous roll of paper at his feet and a heavy curtain going to tumble down on his head those accessories being understood to represent the noble lord as somehow in the act of saving his country pray take a seat mrs lamley mrs lamley takes a seat and opens the conversation i have no doubt mr twemlow that you have heard of a reverse of fortune having befallen us of course you have heard of it for no kind of news travels so fast among one's friends especially mindful of the one during dinner twemlow with a little twinge admits the imputation probably it will not says mrs lamley with a certain hardened manner upon her that makes twemlow shrink have surprised you so much as some others after what passed between us at the house which is now turned out at windows i have taken the liberty of calling upon you mr twemlow to add a sort of postscript to what i said that day mr twemlow's dry and hollow cheeks became more dry and hollow at the prospect of some new complication really says the uneasy little gentleman really mrs lamley i should take it as a favour if you could excuse me from any further confidence it has been one of the objects of my life which unfortunately has not had many objects to be inoffensive and to keep out of cabals and interferences mrs lamley by far the more observant of the two scarcely finds it necessary to look at wemmo while he speaks so easily does she read him my postscript to retain the term i have used says mrs lamley fixing her eyes on his face to enforce what she says herself coincides exactly with what you say mr twemlow so far from troubling you with any new confidence i merely wish to remind you what the old one was so far from asking you for interference i merely wish to claim your strict neutrality twemlow going on to reply she rests her eyes again knowing her ears to be quite enough for the contents of so weak a vessel i can i suppose says twemlow nervously offer no reasonable objection to hearing anything that you do me the honour to wish to say to me under those heads but if i may with all possible delicacy and politeness entreat you not to range beyond them i i beg to do so sir says mrs lamley raising her eyes to his face again and quite daunting him with her hardened manner i imparted to you a certain piece of knowledge to be imparted again as you thought best to a certain person which i did says twemlow and for doing which i thank you though indeed i scarcely know why i turned traitress to my husband in the matter for the girl is a poor little fool i was a poor little fool once myself i can find no better reason seeing the effect she produces on him by her indifferent laugh and cold look she keeps her eyes upon him as she proceeds mr twemlow if you should chance to see my husband or to see me or to see both of us in the favour or confidence of any one else whether of our common acquaintance or not is of no consequence you have no right to use against us the knowledge i entrusted you with for one special purpose which has been accomplished this is what i came to say it is not a stipulation to a gentleman it is simply a reminder twemlow sits murmuring to himself with his hand to his forehead it is so plain a case mrs lamley goes on as between me from the first relying on your honour and you that i will not waste another word upon it she looks steadily at mr twemlow until with a shrug he makes her a little one-sided bow as though saying yes i think you have a right to rely upon me and then she moistens her lips and shows a sense of relief i trust i have kept the promise i made through your servant that i would detain you a very few minutes 
and he trouble you no longer mr twemlow day says twemlow rising as she rises pardon me a moment i should never have sought you out madam to say what i am going to say but since you have sought me out and are here i will throw it off my mind was it quite consistent in candour without taking that resolution against mr fledgeby that you should afterwards address mr fledgeby as your dear and confidential friend and entreat a favour of mr fledgeby i was supposing that you did i assert no knowledge of my own on the subject it has been represented to me that you did then he told you retorts mrs lamley who again has saved her eyes while listening and uses them with strong effect while speaking yes it is strange that he should have told you the truth says mrs lamley seriously pondering pray where did a circumstance so very extraordinary happen twemlow hesitates he is shorter than the lady as well as weaker and as she stands above him with her hardened manner and her well-used eyes he finds himself at such a disadvantage that he would like to be of the opposite sex may i ask where it happened mr twemlow in strict confidence i must confess says the mild little gentleman coming to his answer by degrees that i felt some compunctions when mr fledgeby mentioned it i must admit that i could not regard myself in an agreeable light more particularly as mr fledgeby did with great civility which i could not feel that i deserved from him render me the same service that you had entreated him to render you it is a part of the true nobility of the poor gentleman's soul to say this last sentence otherwise he has reflected i shall assume the superior position of having no difficulties of my own while i know of hers which would be mean very mean was mr fledgeby's advocacy as effectual in your case as in ours mrs lamley demands as ineffectual can you make up your mind to tell me where you saw mr fledgeby mr twemlow i beg your pardon i fully intended to have done so the reservation was not intentional i encountered mr fledgeby quite by accident on the spot by the expression on the spot i mean at mr ryer's in st mary axe have you the misfortune to be in mr ryer's hands then unfortunately madam returns twemlow the one money obligation to which i stand committed the one debt of my life but it is a just debt pray observe that i don't dispute it has fallen into mr ryer's hands mr twemlow says mrs lamley fixing his eyes with hers which he would prevent her doing if he could but he can't it has fallen into mr fledgeby's hands mr ryer is his mask it has fallen into mr fledgeby's hands let me tell you that for your guidance the information may be of use to you if only to prevent your credulity in judging another man's truthfulness by your own from being imposed upon impossible cries twemlow standing aghast how do you know it i scarcely know how i know it the whole train of circumstances seem to take fire at once and show it to me oh then you have no proof it is very strange says mrs lamley coldly and boldly and with some disdain how like men are to one another in some things though their characters are as different as can be no two men can have less affinity between them one would say the mr twemlow and my husband yet my husband replies to me you have no proof and mr twemlow replies to me with the very same words but why madam twemlow ventures gently to argue consider why the very same words because they state the fact because you have no proof men are very wise in their way quoth mrs lamley glancing haughtily at this nixworth portrait and shaking out her dress before departing but they have wisdom to learn my husband who is not over-confiding ingenuous or inexperienced sees this plain thing no more than mr twemlow does because there is no proof yet i believe five women out of six in my place would see it as clearly as i do however i will never rest if only in remembrance of mr fledgeby's having kissed my hand until my husband does see it and you will do well for yourself to see it from this time forth mr twemlow though i can give you no proof as she moves towards the door mr twemlow attending on her expresses his soothing hope that the condition of mr lamley's affairs is not irretrievable i don't know mrs lamley answers stopping and sketching out the pattern of the paper on the wall with the point of her parasol it depends there may be an opening for him dawning now or there may be none 
we shall soon find out if none we are bankrupt here and must go abroad i suppose mr twemlow in his good-natured desire to make the best of it remarks that there are pleasant lives abroad yes returns mrs lamley still sketching on the wall but i doubt whether billiard playing card playing and so forth for the means to live under suspicion at a dirty double dote is one of them it is much for mr lamley twemlow politely intimates though greatly shocked to have one always beside him who is attached to him in all his fortunes and whose restraining influence will prevent him from causes that would be discreditable and ruinous as he says it mrs lamley leaves off sketching and looks at him restraining influence mr twemlow we must eat and drink and dress and have a roof over our heads always beside him and attached in all his fortunes not much to boast of in that what can a woman at my age do my husband and i deceived one another when we married we must bear the consequences of the deception that is to say bear one another and bear the burden of scheming together for to-day's dinner and to-morrow's breakfast till death divorces us with those words she walks out into duke street st james's mr twemlow returning to his sofa lays down his aching head on its slippery little horsehair bolster with a strong internal conviction that a painful interview is not the kind of thing to be taken after the dinner bills which are so highly salutary in connection with the pleasures of the table but six o'clock in the evening finds the worthy little gentleman getting better and also getting himself into his obsolete little silk stockings and pumps for the wondering dinner at the veneerings and seven o'clock in the evening finds him trotting out into duke street to trot to the corner and save a sixpence in coach hire tippins the divine has dined herself into such a condition by this time that a morbid mind might desire her for a blessed change to sup at last and turn into bed such a mind has mr eugene raeburn whom twemlow finds contemplating tippins with the moodiest of visages while that playful creature rallies him on being so long overdue at the woolsack skittish his tippins with mortimer lightwood too and has raps to give him with her fan for having been best man at the nuptials of these deceiving what's their names who have gone to pieces though indeed the fan is generally lively and taps away at the men in all directions with something of a grisly sound suggestive of the clattering of lady tippins bones a new race of intimate friends has sprung up at the veneerings since he went into parliament for the public good to whom mrs veneering is very attentive these friends like astronomical distances are only to be spoken of in the very largest figures boots says that one of them is a contract who it has been calculated gives employment directly and indirectly to five hundred thousand men brewer says that another of them is a chairman in such request at so many boards so far apart that he never travels less by railway than three thousand miles a week buffer says that another of them hadn't a sixpence eighteen months ago and through the brilliancy of his genius in getting those shares issued at eighty-five and buying them all up with no money and selling them at par for cash has now three hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds buffer particularly insisting on the odd seventy-five and declining to take a farthing less with buffer boots and brewer lady tippins is eminently facetious on the subject of these fathers of the script church surveying them through her eye-glass and inquiring whether boots and brewer and buffer think they will make her fortune if she makes love to them with other pleasantries of that nature veneering in his different way is much occupied with the fathers too piously retiring with them into the conservatory from which retreat the word committee is occasionally heard and where the fathers instruct veneering how he must leave the valley of the piano on his left take the level of the mantelpiece cross by an open cutting at the candelabra seize the carrying traffic at the console and cut up the opposition root and branch at the window curtains mr and mrs podsnap are of the company and the fathers descry in mrs podsnap a fine woman she is consigned to a father boots's father who employs five hundred thousand men and is brought to anchor on veneering's left thus affording opportunity to the sportive tippins on his right he as usual being mere vacant space to entreat to be told something about those loves of navvies 
and whether they really do live on raw beefsteaks and drink porter out of their barrows but in spite of such little skirmishes it is felt that this was to be a wondering dinner and that the wondering must not be neglected accordingly brewer as the man who has the greatest reputation to sustain becomes the interpreter of the general instinct i took says brewer in a favorable pause a cab this morning and i rattled off to that sale boots are devoured by envy says so did i buffer says so did i but can find nobody to care whether he did or not and what was it like in guise veneering i assure you replies brewer looking about for anybody else to address his answer to and giving the preference to lightwood i assure you the things were going for a song handsome things enough but fetching nothing so i heard this afternoon says lightwood brewer begs to know now would it be fair to ask a professional man how on earth these people ever did come to such a total smash brewer's divisions being for emphasis lightwood replies that he was consulted certainly but could give no opinion which would pay off the bill of sale and therefore violates no confidence in supposing that it came of their living beyond their means but how says veneering can people do that ha huh, that is felt on all hands to be a shot in the bull's eye how can people do that the analytical chemist going round with champagne looks very much as if he could give them a pretty good idea how people did that if he had a mind how says mrs veneering laying down her fork to press her aquiline hands together at the tips of the fingers and addressing the father who travels the three thousand miles per week how a mother can look at her baby and know that she lives beyond her husband's means i cannot imagine Eugene suggests that Mrs. Lamley, not being a mother, had no baby to look at. True, says Mrs. Veneering, but the principle is the same. Boots is clear that the principle is the same. So is Buffer. It is the unfortunate destiny of Buffer to damage a cause by espousing it. The rest of the company have meekly yielded to the proposition that the principle is the same, until Buffer says it is when instantly a general murmur arises that the principle is not the same but i don't understand says the father of the three hundred and seventy five thousand pounds if these people spoken of occupied the position of being in society they were in society veneering is bound to confess that they dined here and were even married from here then i don't understand pursues the father how even their living beyond their means could bring them to what has been termed a total smash because there is always such a thing as an adjustment of affairs in the case of people of any standing at all eugene who would seem to be in a gloomy state of suggestiveness suggests suppose you have no means and live beyond them this is too insolvent a state of things for the father to entertain it is too insolvent a state of things for any one with any self-respect to entertain and is universally scouted but it is so amazing how any people can have come to a total smash that everybody feels bound to account for it specially one of the fathers says gaming table another of the fathers says speculated without knowing that speculation is a science boots says horses lady dippin says to her fan two establishments mr podsnap saying nothing is referred to for his opinion which he delivers as follows much flushed and extremely angry don't ask me i desire to take no part in the discussion of these people's affairs i abhor the subject it is an odious subject an offensive subject a subject that makes me sick and i and with his favorite right arm flourish which sweeps away everything and settles it for ever mr bodsnap sweeps these inconveniently unexplainable wretches who have lived beyond their means and gone to total smash off the face of the universe eugene leaning back in his chair is observing mr bodsnap with an irreverent face and may be about to offer a new suggestion when the analytical is beheld in collision with the coachman the coachman manifesting a purpose of coming at the company with a silver salver as though intent upon making a collection for his wife and family the analytical cutting him off at the sideboard the superior stateliness if not the superior generalship of the analytical prevails over a man who is as nothing off the box and the coachman yielding up his salver retires defeated then the analytical perusing a scrap of paper lying on the salver with the air of a literary censor 
adjusts it, takes his time about going to the table with it, and presents it to Mr. Eugene Rayburn, whereupon the pleasant Tippin says aloud, The Lord Chancellor has resigned, with distracting coolness and slowness, for he knows the curiosity of the charmer to be always devouring. Eugene makes a pretense of getting out an eyeglass, polishing it, and reading the paper with difficulty long after he has seen what is written on it. What is written on it in wet ink is young blight. Waiting, says Eugene over his shoulder, in confidence with the analytical. Waiting returns the analytical in responsive confidence. Eugene looks, excuse me, towards Mrs. Veneering, goes out and finds young blight, Mortimer's clerk, at the hall door. You told me to bring him, sir, to wherever you was, if he come while you was out and I was in, says the discreet young gentleman, standing on tiptoe to whisper, and I've brought him. Sharp boy, where is he? asks Eugene. He's in a cab, sir, at the door. I thought it best not to show him, you see, if it could be helped, for he's a-shaking all over, like blight simile is perhaps inspired by the surrounding dishes of sweets, like Lumange. Sharp boy again, returned Eugene, I'll go to him, goes out straight away, and, leisurely leaning his arms on the open window of a cab in waiting, looks in at Mr. Dolls, who has brought his own atmosphere with him, and would seem from its odour to have brought it, for convenience of carriage, in a rum cask. Now, Dolls, wake up. Mr. Rayburn, direction? Fifteen shillings. After carefully reading the dingy scrap of paper handed to him, and as carefully tucking it into his waistcoat pocket, Eugene tells out the money, beginning incautiously by telling the first shilling into Mr. Dahl's hand, which instantly chucks it out of window, and ending by telling the fifteen shillings on the seat. Give him a ride back to Charing Cross. Sharp boy, and there get rid of him. Returning to the dining room and pausing for an instant behind the screen at the door, Eugene over years above the hum and clatter, the fair Tippin saying, I am dying to ask him what he was called out for. Are you? mutters Eugene. Then perhaps if you can't ask him, you'll die. So I'll be a benefactor to society and go. A stroll and a cigar, and I can think this over. Think this over. Thus, with a thoughtful face, he finds his hat and cloak, unseen by the analytical, and goes his way. End of chapter 17